Vore, and today we're going to talk about the second lecture in project management and some basic tools and techniques just to give you a feel for how this works. I mean, you should be able to go out and plan better a, a, a small project, you know, kind of a personal project, or with a group of two or three that, you know, a project that'll take a week or two to do. Uh, but real complicated projects require uh, software to help manage them these days. And we'll talk about that as we explore these tools and techniques. Just to refresh you, and then these definitions might be a little bit different than the definitions in the other lecture. That's just to give you perspective because not everybody defines it the same. Our four-step method here might be slightly different than the four-step method we had last time. Again, to give you perspective, and even the look of the project management triangle will look a little bit different. So a project is a temporary and customized initiative that consists of smaller tasks and activities. These tasks and activities have to be coordinated and completed to finish the entire project. And of course, the goal is, is to finish the entire effort on time and within a budget and achieving all the goals that you desired, uh, all the specifications. So project management involves all of the work activities associated with planning, scheduling, controlling, and completing projects. Uh, I was wrong, it was a five-step method. Define, plan, organize, control, close. I think last time we had, um, I can't even remember what they were last time. Plan, initiate, control, close. But it doesn't matter. Four or five steps, it's all the same. Uh, the reason we have so many different steps when it comes to project management is we have so many different project managers and we have so many different consultants and book writers and they can't all use the same model or else they'll have nothing new to show. <clears throat> so someone has a five-step model, someone has a six-step model, they all kind of do the same thing. So define, understand the goal of the project, responsibilities, deliverables, and what must be accomplished. Again, this is like the project charter we've talked about. Plan, <clears throat> determine the steps needed to execute the project Delegate the tasks and identify start and completion date for all the tasks. Organize the resources to execute the plan that we just finished cost effectively. And then we want to make sure everybody's on time, complete, and moving along according to schedule. So that would be the control part. Eventually, because you've controlled, you've planned it, organized it, and controlled it so well, the project ends. And there is a formal closure. You compile statistics, you reassign people as necessary, and capture all the lessons learned. And as I like what the other, in the other lecture we talked about, celebrate. I think that's always an important part. Uh, principles. So that project managers have to adhere to. Well, mostly it's managing people. You want to manage them individually <clears throat> and as a team. You want to keep up the level of excitement. You're like a coach. You're like an athletic coach. You want to reinforce the commitment, <clears throat> foster that teamwork and excitement to keep everybody on task and enthused to get it done. Your job is to communicate with everyone, customers, stakeholders, sponsor, team members, whoever it may be. And while you're reinforcing and committing in the excitement of the team, you know, there's things that are going to come up. Uh, people are not going to get along. They're not going to agree. They're going to disagree. They're going to get stuck. And your job is to lubricate and oil all those things to make them mesh better. So basically you want to be a peacemaker. You want to be a consensus maker. You want to reinforce the agreements that 
everybody agreed to had at the beginning of the project. So you want to build agreements and consensus amongst the team, <clears throat> and that's all members of the team, and you want as much as power to, uh, in, in your power to empower the team to get work done. The org structure, um, a pure project team with team members assigned exclusively to the team. Well, that's, that's good if you can get that, but sometimes you get pure functional structure. Um, charters, you know, you might have a team charter that, that has a pure functional structure, and maybe these people are working full-time, maybe they're working part-time. Um, if the project is extensive and long-term, like it's a two-year project, you probably would want your people to be full-time on your team, and then some people to be part-time. On the other hand, if it's just a, uh, a short-term project, probably you're going to have more of an ad hoc team to get these things done. Uh, oftentimes we look at a matrix structure that people are on a team, but they report to their functional area at the same time because well, they can go back to their functional area and get more help in a specific, on specific activities or tasks as necessary so that you want that functional structure to remain. Plus, if they're on your team full time, uh, they want a function to go back to. So it's, it's good for them not to be forgotten about while they're working on your team project. Mostly in this lecture, we're going to talk about the techniques for planning, scheduling, and controlling projects. And it all has to do with the um, project management triangle. It has to do with time. It has to do with resources. And resources are both human and um, economic, so costs are involved. Um, just to remind you that we presented this slide in the previous lecture. Contrib contributors to project success, impediments, impediment, gee whiz, impediments to project success, well-defined and agreed upon objectives, ill-defined project objectives. Contributors, top management support, strong project management leadership, lack of executive champion, inability to develop and motivate people on the other end of that. A well-defined project definition. A poorly defined fuzzy project definition. That will of course lead to scope creep. It will lead to people not being clear on their objectives. Uh, accurate time and cost estimates. As accurate as you can be at the beginning when you don't know everything. Well, uh, if you don't have that up front, your project may stall because you might run out of time and money and people uh, and ma other managers might pull their people out from your project because you said it was only going to be four months and here it is eight months later. Um, so planning is, is important and estimating is important, the best you can do. Uh, teamwork and cooperation, well, whenever you have a team of people working on something, the better that team can work together will contribute to the end result. Uh, if they don't get along well, if they're dysfunctional, your project will probably take longer and cost more money. Effective use of management tools, uh, again, will contribute to getting your project done on time and within budget. If you don't, it will probably take longer. Uh, clear channels of communication, again, if there's any roadblocks, the channels of communication to keep everybody informed and get them involved in decisions as they need to be will help get your project done. Pure communication amongst the stakeholders will have the opposite effect. Adequate resources and reasonable deadlines. I mean, you want to challenge people to work harder and get more done than they thought possible. That's always something a good manager wants to do, but you don't want to give them an impossible task unless it's an impossible time. Like people work around the clock in the early days of COVID setting up remote hospitals that thankfully we didn't have to use. But there was a pressing need. So make the, the you know, deadlines reasonable and have the adequate resources. Don't overstaff it, don't understaff it. If it's a true, true emergency, you got to do what you got to do. 
and you're going to have unreasonable deadlines and probably have to do meet unreasonable deadlines with inadequate staffs. Um, constructive response to conflict versus inability to resolve conflicts. If you can't resolve conflicts, you have no business being a project manager. That is a part of the job. So here are um, some techniques. Project definition, identifying the activities that must be completed. Well, project definition, this is beyond, this is assuming the charter that we talked about last time it's done. It's funny, some books never talk about charter. Uh, some spend a lot of time talking about charter. Uh, I'm a big fan of having a charter so that you know up front what you're going to do, more importantly, what you're not going to do, what's the measurements of success, all of that, how much money and time that you have initially allocated. But we're gonna look at project definition here after assuming a charter is done. We wanna identify the activities and tasks that must be completed and the sequence in which they must, must be done. Uh, when you're building a nuclear submarine, you don't build the hull and then try to put the nuclear reactor inside. No, you half build the hull and you put all the stuff that goes inside the submarine inside. If you fully build the hull, you can't put those really big things like inside the submarine anymore. Resource planning. How, many, how much resource do you need for each of these activities in terms of uh, budget and people? Uh, schedule a project. Have a time schedule for the completion of each activity. And then how do you control once you have, if it's complicated, that all the parts are being done kind of on time and, and mostly complete so that your project gets done when you think it's going to get done. So project definition, activities. These are the tasks, discrete tasks, which means individual tasks, the tasks that you can list out. They consume uh, human resources, uh, capital resources, money, and time. And you want to have a work breakdown structure. It's a hierarchical tree of end items that will be accomplished, you know, they're kind of organized almost into an outline, if you will. Here's an example. This is a work breakdown structure. If you look at this, we're making, the project is to make a new toy to, for five to nine years old. This is very general. Uh, what you do is some market research, product design, product development, production planning, marketing, and project management. Okay, we could argue, we could change it. It could be more, it could be less. Well, let's stick with this. So this is at the 1.0 level. Then at the next level, the first decimal place, is the next level of work breakdown structure. Design a new toy for kit. Well, if that's all you had, how do you do that? But then we say, well, we have to do that. We break it down to the next steps. Well, in each of these steps, you could have a mini project. And that's what the next level of work breakdown is. Focus groups, design, bill of materials, production design, marketing strategy. Um, so you have at the next level, you have four activities that can be done. And usually what happens is you go down the work breakdown structure, you have at the top, you know, the project itself. Then you have the basic building blocks, which probably you think should happen sequentially, but they don't, because when you start looking at the next level of work breakdown structure, which becomes more numerous, and if there's another level below this, I mean, if you're gonna plan a focus group, you've gotta hire a company or assign someone that's going to run the focus group. You're gonna, um, then they, their job will be to plan them, get the people that are going to come in, the, you know, mothers and kids that are going to come in and um, play with a variety of different toys that you've selected and decide which ones are best. And then you've got to compile the data from the focus groups. How many are you going to have would be another question. And then uh, present that data to the rest of the team. You, and 
so then it goes into the product design. It probably you can't do product design really without having that focus group information. And so there's no limit. Imagine if you're doing, and my favorite example is a nuclear submarine or an aircraft carrier, it doesn't matter. I mean, you every one of the first breakdown structures is like a separate project. It's almost like building an aircraft carrier, you could, you could decide it's a program. And then you have the basic building blocks, and then you have the, de the start getting into the detailed activities. Uh, a chart for something like that a work breakdown structure chart for something like that could fill up the wall of a very large room. So you want to have this hierarchy. One first level, second level, and then this is all third level. Now, <clears throat> for most examples, we will not have a very extensive work breakdown structure because the more extensive the work breakdown structure, and it happens very quickly, the project becomes so complicated you almost can't do things like we're going to do by hand. So let's look at the activities, uh, project definition. What are the activities? Now we had a work breakdown structure. Now we want to create an activity chart. What is an activity chart? Well, we took all of those activities from the work breakdown structure, from that chart, and put them in an outline format almost. And we have a couple things we want to look at. So we have the chart, we have its number, so we know what the number of the activity is, and maybe the activity, um, so we have the work package, which is the top level, uh, market research perhaps, or maybe it's focus group and there's four things that go. There's um, research and analysis, one thing, market research findings, research evaluation, design document, bill of materials, blah, blah, blah. Go through that whole, every one of the work packages that you have there. What's the um, work breakdown structure identification? What's the activity that happens in there? The, the three activities that happen under uh, focus groups. So it takes it down to a whole next level. And then you have to say, what are the which tasks must be done before I can do this task? I need the inputs from which tasks to do this one and that one. So you can see that even with this very simple thing, we have a long list of activities. Imagine again if it's an aircraft carrier or a nuclear submarine, it's just it can get uh, very complicated very quickly. You want to find out those immediate predecessors. What are the activities that must be completed before the line item that you're concerned with at that moment may start? So it's precedence relationships and sure, it guarantee that the activities are performed in a proper sequence when they are scheduled. I mean, like I said, you don't want to, uh, you're building an aircraft carrier or a nuclear submarine, the first thing you want it to do is install the propeller. It just makes no sense. Um, you're baking chocolate chip cookies. Uh, the first thing uh, you you want to do is not add the chocolate chips. You probably want to gather all the ingredients and get the mixing bowl and the mixer and pour the dry ingredients um, in to the bowl, which may or may not include the chocolate chips. And then mix them, you know, that kind of thing. So you don't want to like do things backwards. Uh, you're writing a term paper. The first thing you do is not turn it in. The first thing you do is, well, obviously before that you have to write it. And then you probably want to edit it. And then you want to probably revise it. And then you probably want to turn it in. Or maybe even then you want to slick it up, you know, improve the, the, the physical, visual presentation thereof, and then turn it in. So you have to know what the precedents are. For most tasks that most people do on their daily lives, they know the sequence of tasks. If you're talking about a, a complex thing like building a skyscraper, 
or <clears throat> again, an aircraft carrier, nuclear submarine, you've got to have those things delineated because if you don't have them sequenced properly, it will take longer. So this one's pretty simple. They just list the work breakdown structure idea of things that have to be done ahead of time and put it there. And now you want to say, how long does it take the task? How long will it take to do each one of those things? Well, you know, you're a company that's built toys before, so you know how long a focus group should take. You know how long a uh, product design should take on average. Why not use that historical data? Now, if you're trying to do something very different, it may take you, you may have a, a, a bigger challenge to try to design this new toy if it's a little bit something different that you've done or you want it to be so cool, so slick, um, that it requires more effort, that's a different story, but you can have those conversations. So you put that duration in weeks. And generally, which team member is the lead on that? You're the project manager, but you're not the project manager and lead and doing everything, you know, doing everything in every aspect of it, you, good project manager, delegates things. So you fill out this activity chart like this. And it's, it, it, you know, we talk about planning. Planning, it takes a long time to do. And the more time you spend in planning, and planning looks like you're, to, at least to sponsors and stakeholders, like you're being idle. But really, the, the time spent in planning is time well spent. It will save you time later. So let's simplify this thing. Let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven activities on this chart. Here's a precedent. A, B, C have no precedent, which means they can start simultaneously if you wanted them to. Uh, D can't be done until A is done. E can't be done until B is done. F can't be done until E is done. G can't be done until B is done. It's not that complicated. But here at the end, we have J can't be done until I and F are done. And K can't be done until G and H are done. And then we've gone through and decided that uh, I think these are weeks. How many weeks each one of these things will take? Looks good. Well, it does look good. But it's a table. It's a chart. We can express this graphically and make it even look better. So let's see how we can do that. You want a project network diagram. It consists of nodes and arcs, which define the precedence relationship between activities. The nodes, which are sets of circles or boxes or, yeah, they're circles or boxes. They represent the activities. The arcs are arrows, and they should have arrows on it because it shows how you, the direction you're going. It shows the precedence. This is an activ uh, This is called activity on node. I, I don't you never use that term myself. AON network representation. Now there's a whole section of mathematics that is called graph theory, and not the kind of graphs you think. It's these kind of network graphs. And operations research industrial engineers uh, spend a lot of time studying this, uh, the practical applications of this graph theory. So if we take this previous chart here, and let's make each one of these a square or a circle, and put arrows that show the precedence, you will end up with something that looks like this. Now, what? You know, you notice they named the activities after famous letters, but they've also then assigned a number to, you know, 1 through 11. I think 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12. And you see um, they've, named, they've used numbers in here, too. D is 4. Uh, zero is the initiation of the project. Uh, three would be C. So they're showing the activity on the line. 
and they're showing the duration of what it takes. Most times they will put A here and they will note the duration within that square. Like I said, it's there's many ways of depicting this. Um, the, the right one to use is the right one that they use is the one that they use in the company that you work for, basically. But it shows here. You got to do A before you got to do D. Well, D requires A, and that's how you put it together, actually. And then what has to be done? E is next. B has to be done. So let's let's draw a line for B. Remember A, B, and C. A, B, and C can all be done simultaneously. D must be done after A. E. So what requires B? G and E. So we have the G task, then we have the E task. And what else um, must be done? Well, if we go down the list, in other words, you start putting down your, you start from the top and you start putting down and adding tasks once you know what the precedents are. Uh, K must be done. So this is K. Must be done. All right, G and H must be done. So there's G and there's H, both leading to this point. This is a little complicated, but this is the way you put a network diagram together. Here's a larger picture of it. There's other ways of looking at it. There's another way of drawing it, where you put the letters inside the nodes, as opposed to on the arcs. And inside the nodes, you take how long it starts. So you'd put a zero here. This is not the same network diagram, by the way. I can probably make a drawing of this one, like I like to see it like this, but this is a different network diagram. And it just shows all the different tasks and what has to be done. Now. You see, in this picture, C is a choke point. It can't be done until A and B are done, and then it has to be done before G, D, and E are accomplished. So C kind of becomes an important task. And maybe you want to split C into a couple tasks so it's not such a critical juncture. If it makes sense, it's really up to you. There's art and science involved in this. So once we have this chart, we have the cost, we have the people resources, how many people do we need? We have to add other columns for how much will it cost to get it done, pure money, uh, people resources, equipment. I mean, if you're excavating, if you're building a building in this excavation, you're going to need earth moving equipment. If, if you are, are in the <clears throat> putting up the girders, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to need uh, cranes to do that. And then you could have column on risks and impact on the project. The activities can have a low, medium, or high risk. In other words, you know how to do it. We've done it a million times before. Don't worry, we got this. Or, gee whiz, this is the first time we're doing this, and it's kind of tricky, and we're not sure it could have some high risk in, in accomplishing it on time and on budget. Also, there's different impacts for different parts of the project. Um, it could have a low, medium, or high impact. Impact is not always applicable in projects, by the way. Risk certainly can be. <clears throat> but most projects that you're going to do at a small um, level don't involve risk. It will not have a risk measure assigned to them. So we have to manage the high risk and high impacts tightly. And most people look at it, if you have risk and impact, you classify them low, 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 medium, low, high, 
risk first, impact second, medium low, medium, medium, medium high, and then you have high low, high medium, high high. So anything with a high in it, high, anything that's high high is at the top of your list. Anything else that has a high, uh, medium high or high medium are number two. And anything that has a high and a low in it, low high or high low, is level three. And then medium mediums, medium low, low lows, you know, we don't, they're the rubber balls. You can let bounce kind of, sort of. I mean, you still have to take care of it. You could still take a low low and screw up your project by not handling it properly. But you really want to make sure that you're highlighting the things that are in your estimation the riskiest and have the most impact. We're not going to cover that in this, but I want to at least present it so you have a feel for it. We're not going to cover equipment. <clears throat> We're not going to look at people, resources, or costs either here because that, that you know, that's what you teach in a uh, full course on project management, not a one-week unit. We are going to teach this thing called critical path method. And we're going to use durations, and we're going to use precedence, and we're going to use a network diagram to find out how long we think we can take the whole project to be done in. I mean, if you look at this, how long is the whole project going to take? Well, I could add up all these tasks and say it's going to take, you know, 5, 10, 14, 18, 26, 30, 38 weeks. Let's do it in 38 weeks. I just add up all the things. That's how long it's going to take. Well, that would be wrong because obviously you can do things simultaneously. You can do A, B, and C simultaneously. Well, okay, so we can do A, B, and C. So maybe that whole part takes two. But I can do it simultaneously. So instead of five, it's two. So I can take three off my 38 and get to 35, etc., etc. We're going to look at how to evaluate this. So the assumptions, project network defines a correct sequence of work <clears throat> in terms of technology and workflow, or in terms of, you know, just how you're going to get things done. Activities are to be independent from one another with clearly defined start and finish dates. That's what you want to get to. Uh, the other assumptions are activity time estimates are accurate and stable. Well, for the time you're doing the analysis, it is. You have nothing else to go on. As, as the project unfolds and you realize that the start and um, the, you know, the activity time estimates are not accurate, you revise them. And you have a methodology for revising and getting approval if, if it's going to take the project's going to take longer or cost more money. It's just what you do. That's your job as a project manager. So if I look at this and I've got here. I look at this chart. I got A, D, I, J. That's a, pro that's a path through this from the beginning to the end. Another path is B, E, F, J. If I do that, I'll get to the end, right? It doesn't mean that, uh, so there's, I'm looking at paths. The other one is B, G, K. The next one is C, H, K. CHK. So I have four paths through this project. And you do this at a certain work breakdown structure. You probably don't want to do it at the lowest level. Maybe within each work breakdown structure in each sub sub project level as you define sub projects, they may do the same thing. They may go through the same thing to find out the optimal time for getting theirs done. But we've defined the paths. They all lead to the end, and they must all be done. But they have different durations. Each path takes a different amount of time. So if we look at it, A, D, I, J, 2, 4, 1, 1. That takes 7. B, E, F, J, which seems to have, it seems to be the longest one visually, is 2, 5, 4, 3. 2, 5, 4, 3. It adds up to 14. BGK is 2, 8, and 5. 
C H N K is one three five. So you add those up, you get the first path takes seven, the second one fourteen, the next one fifteen, the next one nine. So these two are the longest, but the longest one is number three. That's our critical path, the one that takes the longest. I can't finish a project in less than that much time. I can certainly finish a project in more than that much time. But there's no slack time in this B, G, K. If I take more than two days to do B, I've got to get B done in two days, and then i got to immediately start G and get it done in eight days, and i got to immediately start K and get it done in five days. If I do that, I can get that path done in 15. If I do all the rest of the activities in their time allotted and the amount sequenced, I can get the whole project done in 15 days. Though it's the longest path that defines the minimum possible time in which you can get the project done. So it's like the chain with the weakest link. How strong is the chain? As strong as this weakest link. What's the minimum time in which I can possibly get the project done? Find the path, the longest path, that's the minimal time. Now, the thing to look at is here. I still got to get to here when G is done. If I'm to, as C and H have to be done in 10 days. Well, it only takes four days. So I could start, I don't have to start C at the beginning. I can start C like three days later. And I, gotta, I can start H maybe immediately or wait a couple days. I have 10 days to do four days worth of work. I can schedule that, but it has to be done by 10 days. Yeah, because if I take longer to do this, what's the point of worrying about my critical path if a non-critical path takes longer because I wasn't paying attention to it? Do you get the picture? That's kind of the essence of project management. So the critical path is the minimum duration, maximum duration path. It sets the minimum possible time in which a project can be completed. And that's, again, assuming all durations are correct. And the project is tightly managed for the things that aren't on the critical path. Normally, you would go through here and you would put the critical path, you'd make it highlight, you'd make the, the arrows bigger, and you'd make them in red or something like that. So, ooh, it's a critical path. But that doesn't mean you can take your sweet time on the other things. Um, if this path, B, E, F, J, which is 14 days, you only have one day of slack there in this 15. So you really can't screw around. And nothing takes one day. So you better treat this almost as critical, too. Start this at the beginning. And as soon as that's done, you're going to start G, but you're going to also start E. You're also, And then five days later, you're going to start F. And then... Um, four days after that, you're going to start J. If not, if you take one day longer, two days longer on, in, in this, now that becomes a critical path. And you don't want that. You want to get it done in 15 days. This path here, seven days. you got a lot of slack in this path. you got a lot of slack in this path. Well, the slack in, in, in path number four doesn't include K. K is on the critical path. It includes... C and H. And this one, there is no critical criticality on this path at all. Until you get to J, because J is uh, also on the, the number two one, that's 14, it's really close to 15. Now you look at this and also say, gee whiz, G takes eight days. Might we break G up into a couple lesser tasks? Do we have, are we trying to do too much in that? Well, you could be. It, maybe there, it makes sense to break it up. And maybe if you break it up into two, two parallel things, you could take the whole thing that takes eight days and maybe do two simultaneous things that only take four days. And now I could reduce. This doesn't become a critical path. I can reduce it down to 14. But if I reduce this critical path by messing with G and doing two simultaneous activities, to shave a few days off there, then B, E, F, J becomes my critical path. So if I shave too much off here, it won't, and the, the, 
the next possible time I could finish the project is 14 days. So uh, as soon as it becomes non-critical, I worry about the, what becomes critical. So uh, project scheduling with the critical path method. Every task has an earliest start and earliest finish time, computed by moving through the project network in a forward fashion. Rules for calculating activity time. Early finish equals early start plus the duration it takes. Early start time for an activity equals the largest early finish time for all the immediate predecessors. Then you have a late start equals late finish minus the time. This is looking at it from the opposite end. Um, the late finish time for an activity is the smallest late start of all the immediate successors. So in other words, if we go back to here, this is my critical path. If I want to start everything early, A starts at zero and ends two days later. C starts at zero day and ends one day later. And you would have the early start here would be, well, after day one is complete, so you could start at day two and three days later, day five, it would be done. And then this follows the schedule. You would then wait until B, there's no slack time on the critical path. It starts at day zero, it takes two days. It starts at day three and takes eight days. And, and then it takes five days. So day two, by day 10 is here, uh, you add five days, day 15. So you could finish these early and they would start here. Or if I want to say this, this has got to be done at day 10. So subtract three, it has to start, the latest start, it could start at day seven. And the latest start for this would be day six. So on this path, if you want to do late start, you sit around for six days, then you start and do it in earnest. Treat it like your critical path. Everything has to happen, snap, snap. Or you treat it like your critical path at the beginning. Let's get this done. One day, three days. At day four, I'm done with C and H. Then I sit around for six days waiting for B and G to be done. You know, I take those resources and maybe put them on G. That would be one way, uh, uh, maybe making G, if you could split it up into two parallel paths, that could help. You could shave off a day or two that way. If the task G is amenable to such, so, one way of looking at the task, uh, some network diagrams use this kind of square. So, the identification number or letter of the activity. They name the, the you know, these on graphics, they usually name them after famous numbers or letters. I like to say that, famous numbers or letters. Like the subways in New York, the A-line, the four subway, the three subway. Uh, T is the amount of time that you're anticipating it will take. Then you have your early start, early finish dates, late start, late finish. Now, if it's on a critical path, these will, these will not exist. Or these will be exactly the same. And the slack time is the difference between early start, late start, and it should be the same as early start, late finish. That tells you how much slack time you have in that project. Anything on a critical path will have zero slack time. So if you change your node, the square node, to look like this, there's a lot of information there. Next thing, project control. Well, schedule specifies that when activities are to be performed. Sometimes due to uncertainty of task times or activity times, there are unavoidable delays or other problems. Projects rarely progress on schedule. Something happens. You know, you can't predict the weather if you're working outdoors and you have a, a hurricane. Uh, that's going to delay things by several days. If uh, you can't have people working on a, uh, outside on a ship, building a ship or building a building if uh, there's gale force winds. 
it's unsafe. You just don't work that day. They're going to put a new roof on my house. If it's pouring rain, they lose that day. It was supposed to be a five-day project. Well, it's going to delay it. A Gantt chart graphically depicts the project schedule in a way. I mean, so does the network diagram. But a Gantt chart is what most project managers use. And you've probably seen pictures of it before. It's hard to draw a Gantt chart without project management software, especially, and you don't really need a Gantt chart unless it's kind of a complicated project. So by the time you get to something where you really need a Gantt chart to help you see what you're doing and keep control of things, you're going to need software. The most popular software is Microsoft uh, Project. I think which a lot of project managers use, but there's been a flurry of other software that's come on the market. There's nothing cheap. I mean, I've, I've looked at uh, trying to find some like uh, open source, easy ways of uh, going from work breakdown structure to the activity chart and fill out the activity chart and at least get a network diagram. I think that would be cool. But again, that, that, there's some programming that's required. And then to find the critical path, and then to lay out all your complexity of your work breakdown structure. And this is not the, any of the ones that we've used before, but you see it has the same kind of outline-y format that talks about the work breakdown. So this is obviously building a house. It's uh, doing the electrical, and they've done it alphabetically, I guess steel erection where, where you don't do the electrical um i guess you rough it in at the same time you're roughing in the plumbing at the same time you're pouring in the concrete that makes no sense to me i don't think you do that i think you rough in the plumbing electrical and rough in the plumbing at some later date pour the concrete first so i wouldn't think you could even start until you've erected some steel columns so I'm not sure what that, how, this is not a good chart to me, but it's an example. It just doesn't make sense to me when I look at it. So here you have time. Here you have the entire work breakdown structure. You have the start and end times that you're going to plan. And it sets, a, and it has a duration in days. And here it gives a graphical description of the things that have to happen here. So it takes me, you know, four days to do that, it takes me three days to do that, it takes me five days to do that, so the whole thing will take um, 12 days. Can I make it go faster? Can I do some of the things? Uh, can I bring the HV equipment in a little sooner and place it and, you know, I, I might be able to move this up. I don't have to wait till the uh, you rough in the electrical, you install, and, and terminate. And then you have HV equipment. I don't know. I don't know enough about building stuff. You can't test and clean the plumbing until you set the plumbing in place. Here they got to rough in the plumbing, I guess, before you pour concrete. It doesn't make any sense. You get the picture. Once you look at it this way, you can see. Now... If um, the line inside shows you the progress and if it gets rescheduled, there's not an example on here. If you decide to change the schedule, it will show the original, but right underneath it will show another bar with the reschedule on it. Maybe if it takes longer, it will start at the same place, but just take longer to finish. And it shows a precedent. This must be done before that can be done. You have to rough in the plumbing before you can install the H, HVAC, HVAC equipment, for example. You have to cure and strip forms before you can uh, erect the steel columns and before you can put the beams in. So it gives some sense of precedence. This is the chart that most project managers they don't really look at a network diagram. This is their network diagram. And this is their activity chart kind of all in one. But you build it up the way we talked about. Uh, crashing a project. 
gee whiz, we want to get it done. I want to, hey, listen, I don't care. In the, the project management triangle, let's say I, there's no limit in cost. I want to, I want to get this done on time, throw all the money you need at it. Uh, just don't spend too much. Might be the mandate you get from your manager. So what's the shortest possible time the activity can realistically be completed? A uh, total additional cost associated with completing an activity in its crash time rather than its normal time. Some things, if I add more people to it, I can get it done faster. Or more resources to it, I can get it done faster. Some things you can't. Can I pour concrete faster in a building? I don't know. I could probably, if I had two cranes, I could probably erect the steel girders on both sides faster. And then maybe because I have cranes, I can have two cement trucks and move the cement up and pour cement faster. Uh, so I can do that, but it costs me more money to do that. Is that important for me? If it's important and you're willing to spend the money, well, then let's get it done. If time is, is critical. So we're always talking about crashing if we can. Uh, the other thing is taking two projects that seem to be si simultaneous is there's some way we can make them, or not simultaneous, but, but sequential. i got to do A before I do B. Is there some way I can structure it so I can start B when A is halfway done? If I can do that, I can shave time, save, shave time off the, the, the project time. So crash cost minus normal cost divided by normal time minus crash time is the crash cost per unit of time. Uh, I'm not going to have you calculate it, but I'm just giving you an idea of what a project manager and a project software, because no one's going to do this by hand. They're going to look at it in the context of the project management software, which helps you look at, you know, let's say you have 300 activities and you're trying to see where I can do some crashing and look at different things. Uh, it's hard to keep track of all that. 300, 500, 1,000 different steps for an aircraft carrier? Come on. You need some software systems. So really, here's the activities that it comes down to. You can add resources, human resources, or money. You can outsource it, which costs you, but you've multiplied your workforce and you're paying for it. you got someone else doing it because you don't have... You know, the people that are doing A are required to do B, and they can't do B until they're done with A. So if I, but I know that if I had extra people, I could start A, B when A is halfway through. Maybe I'll outsource B to someone else. They'll work in conjunction with A. But if A takes uh, four time units, but B can start at time unit two instead of at time unit five. Okay, let's do that. If, if we want. And then the, the important part here, if this is even possible. Some things, the laws of physics apply. I can't do B until A is finished completely. Well, then you can't crash that. You could look at it, you could try to do it, but the laws of physics and engineering may prevent that from being possible. All the while, we're looking at the project management triangle. We want the quality of the project is defined by three things. Um, how much did it cost? Was it within, at or within or less than budget? Was did it meet the time schedule or beat the time schedule? And did it achieve all of the technical specifications that you were looking for? Again, it's important to know in your project which one of these can't budge, and there's always at least one that can't budge. If you got to get it done on time, the only trade-offs you have are in functionality or cost. These are the levers you have to make time hit its mark. If the functionality is sacrosanct, and I want it to be like a space launch, which is the best example, it has to be safe, you're going to trade off cost and time to do that. Now we're going to we're going to launch the the space uh, the next. Launching will be on uh, June 1, but, you know, oh, gee whiz, um, 
we're afraid that you know the reliability, the risk of the mission is compromised. Uh, we either let's move it back to July one and maybe spend more money to fix the problem. If we don't spend enough money to fix the the risk issue that we had, it may have to be delayed till August one, for example. If cost is the most important part, well, what are you going to trade off time? You're going to trade off scope. And mostly scope suffers if cost is being compromised. Well, it looks like we're going to go over budget. I told you, you want to be fired if you go over $5 million This project is uh, on this project? You're out. Okay. Are you willing to take less bells and whistles? I told you. $5 million is the limit I'm going to spend on this. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you, because of things that we've learned along the way, we're not going to give you bells and whistles X, Y, and Z, and we're going to delay the time by three weeks. Are you okay with that? Is it within budget? Yes. Okay, fine. I mean, that's how those conversations go in great summary. Speaking of summaries, a project is a temporary and customized initiative that consists of many smaller tasks and activities. We looked at how to take those activities and put some time durations to it, resource durations, budget, all kinds of things. Then we looked at uh, and what has to happen before you know the whole predecessor. exercise in which we decide which tasks have to be completed before this task can even start. So your homework will include finding critical paths and drawing network diagrams, basically. Because that's really all at this level you can do, and you get a feel for that then, how it works. So I thank you very much, and we'll talk soon.